So this is the 13th lecture in a lecture series that's the overall theme is creating an international sustainable civilization. The next six lectures, number 13 through 18, focus on a working group that met at the Pontifical Academy in 2015, 20, between 2016 and 2018. It consisted of members of many different religious traditions and humanistic traditions, and they're working together to find common ground where they can all agree on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So they can all go back to their countries and to the religious leaders in their traditions and convince them to educate their people, their citizens, or their parishioners to work toward sustainability and also social justice and all of the goals, an educational system. There are a number of different goals. It's very holistic. If we want to create a, a civilization, we have to include uh, many, many dimensions because culture is multi-dimensional. So, the first lecture is about, so this one goes back to Indonesia's Panchasila. Principle number three is unity and diversity. Definitely, you have diverse worldviews, some religious, some humanitarian, some spiritual humanism is what I call the Greeks, some contemporary systems thinking, some... Uh, secular humanism. So we have unit, we're going to find unity and diversity. And number four is democracy guided by inner wisdom in the unanimity arising out of deliberation among representatives. So um, in Indonesia, those representatives are, are elected officials in the this particular uh, meeting group. It's representatives from the religious traditions or the humanist traditions. So they are going to deliberate with each other and come up with a unanimous decision, some agreements, and it's a, it's a democracy, right? No one person is gonna be able to then force anybody else to do it. It has to be done by choice. Um, all right. So before I start quoting from the text in the book, Ethics in Action for Sustainable Development, I thought I'd bring in a few quotes that I think are very relevant from other articles. So there are many, many publications arising more and more in the scholarly academic communities. But this one I particularly like. He says, many fear that bringing religion into the environmental movement will threaten objectivity, scientific investigation, professionalism, or democratic values because of these stereotypes uh, about religions. But I've already shown, um, I think in many ways that the wisdom traditions, the, the iconic characters, who were the foundation for these traditions were not anti-science and they were very democratic. But it's what's happened since then when these traditions get institutionalized, they get weaponized, the people who run the institutions who represent the traditions are more concerned with money and power than with actually representing the te teachings and the way of life that the, the founder uh, tried to pass on to posterity. But anyway, none of these need to be displaced in order to include the spiritual dimension in environmental protection. That dimension, if introduced in the process of environmental policy, planning, administration, education, and law, could help create a self-consciously moral society, which would put conservation and respect for God's creation first, 
and relegate individualism, materialism, and our modern desire to dominate nature in a subordinate place. So this is really important because during the Enlightenment, science was harnessed to the desire to exploit nature, dominate. That was Francis Bacon's mission statement. And then it was also tied, the values were the values of individualism, individual rights, and community was not valued enough. And it was more materialistic. Um, if, if you can prove that your leader is not helping you economically, then that would be the, a major criteria for deciding if they're just or not. Whereas in the ancient view, it's whether the leader rules for the benefit of the ruled, whether they can create a middle class. And if that means that some people on the top are not better off materially, that's okay. Aristotle wanted a um, very high inheritance tax. He did not want the rich to be able to pass on their money and to create uh, an oligarchy, a class of wealthy people that are separated from the rest of the society. So, um, so it's uh, modern values were much more by definition individualistic, materialistic, and dominating nature. It doesn't mean that every modern person is that way. It's just about the ideologies and the philosophies. Okay. So religion can provide at least three fundamental mainstays to help human beings cope in a technological society. First, it defends the individual's existence against the depersonalizing effect of the techno-industrial techno process. Second, it forces the individual to recognize human fallibility. And third, religion gives the moral strength to grow in virtue. It can be a powerful source for environmental conservation and protection. So instead of religion here, I would say the wisdom traditions, because uh, the Greek tradition is was their religion, but we associate it with humanism. And so I would just call it um, spiritual humanism, but they value wisdom and knowledge has to be guided by wisdom. So we know that in a techno-industrial society, uh, people move in order to get a better job. People are torn away from their families and put into uh, factories or office buildings. I mean, there is a higher, obviously the material standard of living in general can become higher, but the exploitation of nature and the collapse or the undermining of family, community, extended family, relationship building over time. These are things that are the cost of this kind of society. There's also um, needing to recognize our limits. Like we need to integrate culture and nature, not continually find another technological fix for the destruction that we've done. And it also gives people need to continually be working on examining their lives and improving um, their self-knowledge and their continually educating themselves and becoming wiser so that they love wisdom. And so to be able to change, to adapt, to continue to desire to do what's best and wisest in a situation is really important. While there are disagreements among world religions, a synthesis of the key concepts and precepts from each of them pertaining to conservation could become a foundation for a global environmental ethic. The world needs such an ethic. So this was written before, long before 2016, but it's it was one of the articles that had the insights that eventually built into the formation of this conference. So here's the, the book. That's the ISBN number for the ebook if people want to buy it. There was in 2015, there was sort of a convergence of a whole lot of P 
people and organizations coming together to focus on developing a sustainable global civilization. Pope Francis wrote Laudato Si, the Catholic Church's statement on the need for an integral ecology that recognizes the essential relationality or interconnectedness of all things. And then in September of 2015, the United Nations General Assembly, Pope Francis spoke at the session at which the sustainable development goals were adopted. And then um, the UN, all 193 UN member nations adopted the Paris Agreement on climate change. So all of this came together in a relatively short period of time. So the uh, Pontific Pontifical Academy decided to bring together these groups. So the core group had Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Jews, Islams, Muslims, um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucians, other traditional Chinese religions, including Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform Jews, Sunni and Shia Muslims, two types of Buddhists, Jews for Jesus, Confucian Catholics, Secular Humanist Buddhists, post-Enlightenment humanists, and others that were not affiliated with any religious tradition. So what religious, the question is, what religious and ethical values are common to all of us that will enable us to achieve the agenda for 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement? This is the project. Every major religion is committed to the core values espoused by the Sustainable Development Goals, which are human dignity and flourishing, the rights of the poor, social justice, and peace. Every major religion has unique and significant assets to bring to the fulfillment of the SDGs. So this is this to me is really important, is that you can't just have the scientists and the intellectuals and the highly educated, highly trained um, elite uh, talking to each other. The reason to bring in these religious traditions is that um, the leaders have a profound code of ethics and a daily dialogue with all parts of society. They, they Many people listen to religious leaders. They identify with their religious tradition. And if they can be satisfied that they're authentic, they're true, they're being faithful to their tradition, and the religious leader tells you that you can connect with these other traditions and we want to save the creation, then you can get people to be motivated to listen to you. And as I said in a recent lecture, um, you have to you have to be careful you have to be conscientious about being one of the intellectual elite you need to reach down and you need to uh, focus on our common humanity and you need to have empathy like the father uh, who tried to have arranged marriages for his daughter you have to have empathy and so a religious leader has to have empathy with their parishioners and try to convince them that they love them, they care about them, and they collectively can organize a way that everybody is better off and has a higher quality of life and even a higher, better quantity, better distribution of resources you know, and while they're going sustainable. It's not a either or, it's not just making a sacrifice. It's just readjusting the way the system is organized. They have religious leaders have face-to-face -face engagement with billions of people around the world, including the poorest people. They have vital institutions of education, health, charity, environmental protection. So they have, there are religious schools. So if you develop a curriculum, they will have more impact. They have hospitals, healthcare, and so that they can 
start making people aware of the effect of climate pollution on people's health and motivate people to, to work to uh, save the creation. Charity that can figure out what charities, nonprofits to donate to that will promote sustainability and social justice and environmental protection. So the churches also are concerned with climate justice, not just um, addressing the scientific issues, but also the distribution, because most of the poor people did not create, they don't generate all the carbon, but they suffer the consequences disproportionately. So they disturb the earth less, but are the victims of the disturbances more. And so, again, a religious leader would be able to explain that and motivate people to call out the rich and the politically powerful and not believe them when they try to convince them that they should continue with the status quo. Religious leaders have the ability to teach and disseminate the vital information needed for global success in sustainable development. So they combine a sense of human dignity and flourishing, that would be Aristotelian, the right to the poor social justice piece with sustainability. That's really important. It's not just a science lecture and it's not just a, a high tech lecture. It's not just a computer, um, computer programming lecture. It's this holistic, um, the idea of the sanctity of the earth, the sanctity of other people, um, and lifting up the poor. Okay, so how do you bring together the key stakeholder groups? So it's not just the religious leaders, okay? Religious leaders also have to show initiative in bringing together the Catholic Church brought scientists, mayors, judges, ethicists, faith leaders of many religions to support integral and human development. Other religions are now convening religious leaders and scientists to work hand in hand on sustainable development initiatives. I hope that Indonesians, especially Indonesian Muslims, will also bring together representatives from each tradition, from members of the different professions within each tradition. I hope the Islamic State Universities can link the goals in this document to their university community engagement projects. And those projects become connected to the SDGs, which I will set out. So I understand that I need to get through to my religious leaders and you know, every scholar, every academic needs to try. They can't just expect another country to do this. They have to fan out in their own country try to alert religious leaders, scientists, um, professionals at many levels. And um, I wish that, as I said in earlier lectures, that the U.S. required um, college professors to be engaged with university community projects, but we don't. Um, but just speaking to the Islamic State Universities, professors in Indonesia, they have a particular um, contribution to make because Islam has a, has a bad reputation in the world as being more extreme or more pro-oil because of the Mideast. Um, and so, so Indonesian Muslims can make clear that Muhammad would not be on board with um, continuing to put carbon into the world, that that's a question of money and power and the and a, a accident of history that people are Muslim where the oil is in the ground. Or you could say, well, maybe originally um, Muslims would be able to link the prosperity from oil to creating a just society and also to making that transition like you could use the income from oil to transition into green but that i don't think that's what they're doing 
And so in Indonesia, you could, you could lay out a sustainable civilization model that's truly Islamic, which is what Mr. Marif wants to do among many other things, and also um, concerned with social justice, and also that you could get university professors to, to educate the public, no matter what other community engagement project they might be doing. They might be setting up a school, they might be setting up a business, but they could include sustainability and the sustainable development goals of the UN. They can educate the villagers, they can include that in the way they operate the project as well as being gender um, equal and bringing in ethnicities into each project, different religious traditions and some Chinese Confucians or Chinese, I think a lot of Chinese are Catholic, but making sure to break down the ethnic, potential ethnic divisions, potential religious divisions, and put all these values together and create a whole history and a whole part of the community based on this new model of an international sustainable um, civilization. The greatest obstacle, and this is something we all should agree on, our greatest vulnerability is the globalization of indifference, meaning humanity's neglect of even its own survival. We're lost in a world of online imagery substance and behavioral addictions, political demagoguery, commercial distractions, rampant consumerism to the point that we neglect the essential needs of our communities. We're manipulated by fear rather than inspired by compassion. Our interdependence obliges us to search for a common plan for humanity and the planet. So this again goes back to me, to Aristotle, the two most basic drives are pleasure and fear. And the, the way that pleasure is exploited by corporations through social media, through images on our phones or computers, then the way they very carefully study the neuro uh, neuroscience to understand how dopamine, serotonin, how the body gets addicted. And so they've created foods and all sorts of uh, things, activities that would make people addicted, addicted to their phones, addicted to what they eat. Um, it isn't just uh, drug addiction, opioid or something. It's all these other things, every aspect of our lives has been um, structured, marketed, and created to lead to a physical addiction. And the political demagoguery, which also combines false hopes, fantasies, and also false fears, phobias, and, and manipulates people. Um, so we can all agree on that. And religious leaders, cultural leaders, professional leaders can continually send their clients, their patients, their parishioners, the same signal and the same basic outlook. And then people can form a different civilization. I'm hoping my lectures will motivate Indonesians to develop a vision and lead their nation and the world. Mr. Marif wanted to develop a curriculum for Muhammadiyah schools. And that's the kind of vision. You have to have a vision before you can set up a curriculum. Their political philosophy combines with the core values of each religious tradition in principle one and with humanism of two to give Indonesians a unique role in taking the lead. Quote, morally attuned individuals with a vision of a common good and the will to achieve, sustain, and maintain that common good are as important as the economic, scientific, and political resources required to achieve the SDGs. So I do agree with this. I think ideas are very powerful and um, people don't realize how powerful they are, but you really do need a kind of core group. 
You need enough people with enough of the same idea to keep sending the same signal and then to keep a certain vision that will lead to restructuring of the economic, scientific, and political resources that we have, right? They have to be united, you know, work together to achieve this goal. Otherwise, they will be too dissipated and the, the system we have right now will be more efficient and people will stick to it because they'll be afraid of the future. They have to be convinced that the present is bad enough that a well-articulated vision of the future that keeps getting reiterated and um, feedback loops, they keep running into the same messages everywhere they go, uh, to the doctor, to the coach, to the teachers, to the preachers. If they keep going, to all these different institutions, the leaders are presenting the same suggestions, the same recommendations. They are restructuring their institutions in the same similar ways. Then people will gradually, or hopefully not too gradually, you know, we can change. And I think we can change pretty quickly if we just had some collective agreement about where we're going, where we need to go. So that's that's this lecture. And so the next one will just continue with more of the insights that the working group arrived at in those years between 2016 and 2018.